silence grew and became intense, wider and deeper. The brain which had listened to the silence of the hills, fields and groves was itself now silent. It had become quiet, naturally, without any enforcement. It was still, deep within itself. Like a bird that folds its wings, it had folded upon itself. It had entered into depths which were beyond itself. It was a dimension which the brain could not capture or understand. And there was no observer witnessing this depth. Every part of one's whole being was alert, sensitive, but intensely still. This new, this depth was expanding, exploding, going away, developing in its own explosions, out of time and beyond space. As Einstein was to Newton, so Krishna G was to us. To, to my mind, he had a single perception from the days in the mid-twenties. From then to the day he died, he had a single integral vision. He brings out this fact that the destiny of humanity is one undivided whole. He had a capacity to laugh and play, and he never lost that. With a chattering mind, you neither contacted the word nor the sacredness. In silence, there was the sacredness. You, had not to, you did not have to contact it. It was there, whether he was speaking, or whether he was silent. The mystic is a man who perceives directly. And St. John of the Cross, one of the great exemplars of this tradition, had a beautifully clear image. He said, if, if I have my hand in front of my eyes, I cannot see the sun. If I have an image of God, I cannot see God. And it's as simple as that. So in this sense, Krishnamurti was a, was a mystic. When one was close to him, one really got the feeling of somebody walking very close to you, walking uh, by the side of your mind, next to your thoughts. And it was that feeling which was free and easy and affectionate that marked his presence. He himself even said that all of his um, words and the videotapes and the books were only a small percentage of what he was doing. And to be anywhere in his presence, one could feel that it wasn't just the words. I think that Krishnamurti looked, at least to my the best of my knowledge, Krishnamurti looked at himself as an expression of what we might call the sacred or the universe, the cosmos, the, that, that ground which it, uh, it's the source of creative intelligence, which is uh, not manifest and beyond time. You know, that, that, that is the ground of everything that is. And he felt that was expressing itself in some unique way through him at this particular stage of human history. I will give you the tools to help you grow up, to be responsible for your actions and your way of living. 
And that is really exactly what he did. He just said, your greed, your fears, your selfishness, your angers and aggression, all of those are stopping you from receiving all this incredible world. So take a journey inside and find out about yourself and grow up. What we are trying in all these discussions and talks here is to see if we cannot radically bring about a transformation of the mind. Not accept things as they are. No revolt against it. Revolt doesn't answer a, a thing. But to understand it, to go into it, to examine it, give your heart and your mind with everything that you have to find out, a way of living differently. But that depends on you and not somebody else. Because in this there is no teacher, no pupil, there is no leader, there is no guru, there is no master, no saviour. You have to, you yourself are the teacher and the pupil, you are the master, you are the guru, you are the leader, you are everything. The speaker is Krishnamurti. He is a man who cannot be placed in a simple category like philosopher or religious leader. He is, however, one of the more challenging and creative men of our time. Born in South India in 1897 and educated in England, he has followed a singular and original path of thought free of factionalism and dogma. This is the first of eight half-hour programs and the first time that Krishnamurti has allowed his talks and private conversations to be filmed. And when you put that question, because you are serious, because you are intent, then you are aware of the whole process of the observer. Which means you are totally attentive. You Completely attentive. And in that attention there is no border, created by the center. Hmm? And when there is complete attention, there is no observer. Huh? The observer comes into being only when in that look there is inattention, which is distraction. We are put away the observer. And therefore there is attention from it last a second, that's good enough. Don't be greedy to have more. In that greed to have more, you've already created the center. And then you're caught. In that attention, there is no seeking at all. And therefore there is no so the mind becomes extraordinarily alert, active, silent. Such a mind is the religious mind. And such a mind has an activity totally different at a different dimension, which thought can never possibly reach. I remember an occasion when a Jain monk walked up, travel weary, must have been about 11 o'clock in the morning and Krishnaji was just going in for his bath. And he said he had been walking for weeks to get there because he learned that Krishnaji was there. And said it was very urgent that he should see him. And 
Krishna ji smiled and he said, uh, you are trying to find an answer, aren't you, sir? You are uh, trying to find a solution. He said, I would rather change this process and merely look at what you are trying to do with yourself. Look at what thought is trying to do to itself. So he said, the thought is trying to persuade itself and pressurize itself to stop its operations. Because it wants to get something out of it. And this is something which thought can't do. So, you have just to grasp the single fact that what you have been trying to do for 14 years is something which thought has been trying to do and there is just no way by which thought will ever be able to do it. Just see this, the finality of it that it is not within the capability of thought to do what you want thought to do. Just see this. Do you see this, sir, what I am saying? The monk was impressed and he said, yes, I do. But he said, you are trying to ask thought to do it for you. Don't do that. But you just watch what thought is doing to itself. And perhaps if you do that and wait, and suddenly there was a change in the uh, appearance of the monk, he closed his eyes and he was quite silent. And after about four minutes, he opened his eyes and his eyes were full of tears. And he touched Krishnaji's feet. And then he said that, sir, I have been wanting to get this for a long time and I have not been doing it. So thank you and I'll go. He said, no, no, don't be in such a hurry. Please sit down for five minutes. The monk sat down. He sat quietly. But suddenly he blurted out, sir, I have some one more question to ask. He said, of course, I'm waiting for that. And he said, well, that was all right. Uh, really, thought was absolutely quiet without my doing anything about it. But how can it last? How can I get it again? And Krishna ji said, that is just the question that I knew you were going to ask me. He said, but who is it that asked the question? The mind that silent is asking this question? Or the mind that was not able to get silent and worrying over it that is asking the question? It is again the old mind. You have gone back to the old mind and that old mind is asking this question because it wants to possess what you got, it wants to hold on to it and continue it. All this is the normal function of thought. When you had moved out of that room and now you want the answer in this room, that is, you want the answer to be with thought. Do you see it? What you are doing? Do you see, sir, what thought is doing to you? Do you see what thought is doing to itself? And again the monk went silent. And this time he was silent for a while. And he opened eyes that were full of peace. And he touched Krishna's feet and said, sir, I will not come to you again. There was a deep, widening intensity, an imminent clarity of that otherness with its impenetrable strength and purity. Love is not a common thing, but it was there in the hut with an oil lamp. It was with that old woman carrying something heavy on her head. It was everywhere so common that you could pick it up under a dead leaf or in that jasmine by the old crumbling house. But everyone was occupied, busy and lost. It was there, filling your heart, your mind and the sky. It remained and would never leave you. Only you would have to die to everything without roots without a tear. Then it would come to you, if you were lucky and forever ceased to run after it, begging, 
hoping, crying, indifferent to it, but without sorrow, thought left far behind, and it would be there on that dusty, dark road. It's interesting that when uh, Krishnamurti first asked me to write his biography, he said to me, um, if he was writing the biography, he would start with the vacant mind. And then he went on to enlarge how he, that he'd always had, he said, a vacant mind. And he seemed to think that the vacant mind was so much a part of him, a part of his teaching, in a way, well, part of him, I suppose. Um, and he said it was because of the vacant mind that all he'd learnt and been taught, rather, about theosophy and all the theosophical jar jargon had never taken root. It was all on the surface of his mind. The, the Theosophical Society, which was founded by Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott, was really a ecumenical movement to show that all religions were equal. I mean, that was the uh, basis of it, which most people joined. But there was also an esoteric side of it which Madame Blavatsky worked out, saying that a, a great hierarchical figure called the Lord Maitreya came to Earth about every 2,000 years and took the body of a human being when they were most needed for the evolution of humanity. Mrs. Annie Besant became the president of the Theosophical Society after Colonel Olcott's death. And then she started looking very seriously with her colleague, C.W. Leadbeater, for a vehicle uh, who they thought would be suitable for the world teacher. Uh, the boy who was eventually chosen to be the Messiah was an Indian boy from South India called Krishna, Jiddu Krishnamurti. And they used to, he and his brother and um, other boys used to play on the beach every afternoon because Adia is on the sea. And one day, Leadbeater saw this boy on the beach and he was tremendously struck by his aura. But he said this aura had not one trace of selfishness in it. And he immediately felt that this was the boy. I arrived in Adia in 1909, in August. And within a few days of my arrival, I met Mr. C. W. Leadbeater. And almost immediately, he introduced me to two Indian boys, J. Krishnamurti and his little brother of uh, Nityanand. Krishnamurti was shy, reserved, mystically inclined, seemingly outwardly to be rather dull and not, and not so quick on the uptake. Whereas his little brother sparkled with intelligence. They were in poor condition, very poor condition. And Leadbeater said, we have been, we have a task. Uh, and when Annie Besant arrives in India, she will help. CWL and Dr. Besant were corresponding about the older boy, K. By then, they had taken the boys to the master, and the master apparently, according to them, said, that is the boy. So they, they had received, they said, instructions from their respective masters that K was going to be the vehicle for the world teacher. And so Leadbeater, the CWL, took charge of training these two boys. Nobody was to touch anything that K touched. If they said they liked oranges, for the rest of the year they had oranges. 
if they said they like porridge, they had porridge every morning for the rest of the year. If they said they wanted to go on a, bi on a bicycle ride, right. You went on a bicycle for the rest of the year every morning from seven to eight. So the boys never said after that they liked anything. Krishnaji was arranged for him to go to the Old Cot School, which was just outside the Theosophical Society headquarters. They wanted him to get in touch with the children of his own age a little. And one day the master of their class said, look, uh, Krishnaji, stay after school, I want to talk with you. And when school was let out at 3.30, uh, he apparently forgot that he'd asked Krishnaji, you know, all the kids get up and they all run out. And Krishnaji stayed. But when he didn't turn up for the meal and people became concerned and so they started looking around the compound, the Theosophical compound, couldn't find him. Some alarm and concern took place. Then finally somebody said, let's go back to the school and start from scratch. And they went back and there he was sitting at the seat in the place where he had been asked to stay. And it was then nine o'clock when they found him. He was taken away from the school. It's an indication that uh, in a sense, he was a will-less child. He was a, a dreamy boy, a boy who was interested in what was actually taking place and not what he wanted to do about it. I've written in, in my earlier writing an account of his initiation and of the meeting with the master and so on and so on, uh, which were all told me by Mr. Ledbeater and by Krishnamurti himself. I was told that, on a, that he had been put on probation by the master along with his little brother on a certain date. And then it was that Krishna used to sit in the early morning and write something very laboriously in his early English, which turned out to be the little book called At the Feet of the Master. And uh, the writing in the book was in pencil and Krishna used to ponder and then write and then ponder and Leadbeater told me he was bringing back into his physical brain in the morning what he had experienced and learned and heard during the night from the Master Kutthumi. I never looked at that, at the details of that little book, but I do know that I, saw the, I did see the book and I saw Krishnaji writing. C.W. had written to, to Dr. Besant in England that his master had told him that K. was to take his initiation. And Dr. Besant wrote to C.W. saying, use my room, if necessary, close all the headquarters and do what you are instructed. So this boy was prepared, bathed properly and dressed and all the rest of it and taken to Dr. Besson's room and went to sleep or became unconscious. I do not, it, it is not clear all this for me, for 24 hours or more. When you stepped over the line into the virgin forests of the occult, you took your first initiation. So Krishna was placed on Annie Besant's bed, bedstead, in her own room, and Lenbita had a mattress on the floor. And then we, Anichum and I, used to supply milk, hot milk, and Krishna would come back to his body and take a little milk and then, because it was the whole period was three days. He was practically away from his body more than not uh, for three days. After he came back to his body, bathed and robed in silk, looking like a god, i never forget it. In fact, he looked so astoundingly remarkable that he, his little brother, prostrated himself at his feet as he came out of the room, and I did the same. He'd taken a step up in physical appearance. He was no longer a skinny little, sorrowful looking boy with a, a rather open mouth and vacant, with a vacant look. 
He was a very alive, aware young boy, ready to step into early manhood. There was a sense of tremendous feeling about all this, not just an intellectual concept, an intellectual invention, but a feeling that great event, great thing around this ball. People were talking around the ball, all the theosophical things, theosophical jargon about um, discipleship and uh, the, how the Master treated the disciples and so on and on. All that went round him all the time, not just for a few days or a few weeks, all the time. And apparently nothing of that entered into the ball. He, saw, he said he saw the Masters then, so on. He was highly, probably sensitive, uh, somewhat perceptive, clairvoyant and all that, because he used to see all kinds of things. All that in no way seemed to touch the ball, which is quite strange. See, my difficulty is now that I don't remember what he was like. I wish I could. I thought a great deal about it, but I can't. I actually don't remember when I met CWL, Dr. Besant, about any of those things. Besant's idea was that this boy should be trained and educated in England for this tremendous role. And the following year, she founded a thing called the Order of the Star in the East. And she was the protector with Leadbeater. They were the two protectors of the order. And Krishnamurti was made the head of it. And he was, went to Benares, where very early on he taught um, older men there. So people immediately said it was like Jesus teaching the elders in the temple. But she thought he must be educated in England. So she took him first of all on a visit in 1911 to England with his brother and the following year she took him to England to be educated and he remained in England until right up to 1920. He was taken to Europe, lived with people who are so-called British aristocracy, butlers, yacht, clothes, you follow? Servants, Rolls Royces, never smoked, never drank. Girls used to come around him, didn't know what it was all about. And so there was this peculiar state of mind which could not be held in a pattern. And they had put him at the head of an organization out of the Star in the East, where he was literally worshipped. And he used to shrink from all that. He was vague. He would tell everybody, I'll do whatever you want. That used to be his favorite phrase, I'll do what you want. Even now sometimes it happens. Of course, the object of the Order of the Star in the East was to spread the gospel, so to speak, to prepare people, um, to prepare themselves to become disciples of the Lord when he came. And that might be 20 years, 30 years, 50 years' time. And um, so there was a tremendous surge of interest in this. And people absolutely flocked, theosophists and non-theosophists, to join this order. And the word was spread all around Theosophical Lodges, all around the world, because it was a worldwide movement. Um, and it became, a, it became a very, very, very great, great thing. Um, and as you can imagine, everybody was tremendously excited to think that when they came, they might be chosen as a, as a disciple and all this. And my mother went very much into this, because she met Krishna in 1911. 
and she befriended him all the time he was in England. Um, in 1921, Mrs. Besant, who was then in India, felt that Krishna had been educated enough and that it was time that he started speaking, lecturing for the society and for the order of the star because they were joined, they were one. Then. And so she sent for him to come back to India. And by that time he was thoroughly disillusioned with his role as Messiah. He didn't believe any of it and he was terribly unhappy. And also what had added to his unhappiness was that his beloved brother Nitya had contracted tuberculosis, but he had been to Switzerland and he was pronounced cured. And so the two of them went off together in November of that year. Um, on their way to Europe, they stopped in San Francisco, where they were lent a cottage in the Ohio Valley from there. They were told it was a marvelous um, climate for tuberculosis. And it was the first time in their lives these two boys, these two brothers who were still very young, had been alone. And quite suddenly, they felt this tremendous warmth and happiness. And I think it was out of that happiness for the first time that in August of that year, Krishna Murti went through unex completely unexpected, really, um, transformation, one might almost call it, a terrific uh, psychic or spiritual experience, which changed him and changed him fundamentally, and found something which people, I suppose, have always, always search one of these marvelous transcendental experiences, and really he kept it, I would say, for the rest of his life. And he was, in fact, from that moment, a changed being. And my mother, who heard of this, he wrote to other people, a wonderful accounts of it, wrote to other people saying, isn't it wonderful that Krishna is happy and has found himself at last. After that amazing experience, Krishnamurti was perfectly happy to go on with his role of training himself, really, being trained as a vehicle for the Lord Maitreya. But then, quite suddenly, Nitya had a very bad relapse and was very, very ill again. And Mrs. Besant wanted uh, Krishna to go to um, Adya um, for the Jubilee Convention in 19. 25, and uh, because it was important he should be there in his role. And he didn't want to go because Nitya was so ill. But he was promised by all the leaders, including Ledbita and um, Mrs. Besant, that Nitya was much too valuable to die, and that Nitya would not die, he would recover. And because of that promise, which he believed, Krishna agreed to go to India that year, leaving Nitya very ill, well looked after, very ill in Ohio. And on the voyage out, in fact, when he got as far as Port Said, India, he had a telegram saying Nitya died. And this was an absolutely shattering blow to him. He never believed it could happen. And it destroyed his faith very largely in the masters, who, who were part of the hierarchy of theosophy, who, who promised this through the clairvoyant people like Ned Beater. And he was absolutely 
distraught by this. And he said he had now suffered, he now knew what death was, and he knew now that there was a love that transcended death, and that it was no longer, the death of someone was no longer to be feared. When the brother died, you know, I was here, we left. And I didn't know he was going to die. When I got to England, they said, we are the disciples. Huh? If you accept us, your brother will live. And when he died, he said, what a joke this is. <laughs> this is the phrase he used. After that, for another couple of years, he still believed in the Lord Maitreya and that he was, and he said at that time, the Lord will come more and more often. It wasn't a question that he'd taken possession, but the Lord would come more often to him, but it would still be the Lord speaking through him. But all this time, I think something was going on in his own mind. He was, he was searching for something himself. But as late as 1927, Mrs. Besant, declared in America to the press, the world teacher is here. And, but it was after 1927 that he gradually began to feel that none of, none of this was, was true or right, that he had to go his own way. But he had to go very gently so as not to hurt Mrs. Besson, because he, he loved her dearly. So there was a tremendously close relationship between them. And so it was a very, very difficult time in his life because he knew that all the leaders, everyone, was against him. We used to drive out to do the walks and we'd be driven back. And sometimes uh, Gordon Pierce, who was very close to Christian G and had known him all his life from the time when he first came to the Theosophical Society headquarters at Adyar. And he came out driving sometimes with us. And one night, uh, he was in the, sitting in the front with Baradas in the drive and Krishna G and I were in the back and he turned right over the back seat, over the front seat and said, Krishna G, is it true, he used to like asking him questions about his early days, and he said, is it true Krishna G that you talk to the Master Kutimi, the Master KH as they call him, the... did you really talk with him? And Krishna G said yes, which was a great surprise to me and it turned out a great surprise to Gordon Pierce too. He said, yes, I used to talk with him, I saw him and talked with him for quite a lot on many occasions. And then came one morning, we used, I used to meditate in the morning from before, not before dawn, but before sunrise, and then it was part of the, the Indian Buddhist meditation procedure. And one morning, uh, the Master KH was there, and I was talking with him, and I thought, look, I've, we've heard these words and all this for a long time. What I'd like to do is to have tactile thing to actually meet this man, to touch him. So he said, I got up, I walked through him, turned, and he wasn't there, and I have never seen him again. In 1929, in Holland, one of these annual, big annual camps he used to hold, and had for several years, he announced at a meeting that he, ha he was the head of the Order of the Star, and he was going to dissolve it. And he said that, it was quite unnecessary to have such an order, such an organization. He said that it was ridiculous, I mean, the gist of what he said, I'm not quoting him at all, to be told how spiritual you were. Only you knew whether you were corrupt or not corrupt inside. Nobody could tell you. And that his only object in life from then would be to set men absolutely free to discover truth for themselves and not to be told what truth was or be led in any way. They had to, they had to find it. They wanted to find it themselves, and he was going to help them to be free. I maintain that truth is a pathless land and cannot be approached by any path whatsoever, by any religion, by any sect. Truth being limitless, unconditioned, unapproachable by any path whatsoever, cannot be organized, nor should any organization be formed to lead or coerce people along any particular path. If you do, it becomes a creed, a sect, a religion to be imposed on others. 
no man from outside can make you free. Therefore, I am not concerning myself with the founding of religions or new sects or the establishment of new theories or new philosophies. On the contrary, I am concerning myself with the only one essential thing, the true freedom of man. My desire is that men should be unconditionally free, to make the mind and the heart of man free from limitation, free from corruption, is happiness, liberation and truth. I always remember the feeling back there in 29, in Amman, about this slight figure of a beautiful person and how incredibly alone he was at that moment. Um, from that day on, Krishnaji was his own man. He would say what he believed and what he wanted to say. He would withstand any attempts to trap him into the old position and there were many such attempts. And to witness the incredible strength and integrity and wholeness of this man in itself seemed to uh, belie the fact that he was just somebody who was searching on his own. He came through with incredible power and it was, I think, very difficult not to say, oh, well, you, you don't want to be the world teacher, but actually look, look at what you are doing. It's not what you are saying. It's not because Mrs. Besant says you are the world teacher, but just because of this act of becoming totally independent of any kind of power structure that, I think, um, made it very difficult not to think that he was somebody very special. So you want to know now what Kate thinks of the world teacher, right? You were brought up in the very center, in the thick of it all. What is your answer? I really don't know. He has never said, who am I? We have never said, is the world teacher true or not true? Is this question relevant at all? What is relevant are the teachings. Who the teacher is is not relevant. But to investigate who the teacher is, we have to find out if you can grasp the quality of mind of the teacher, I personally I feel it's something so immense mm -hmm. that the brain saying, well, I'm going to find out, can't find out. But there is something extraordinary which happens, which shows, which occurs, which, which gives hints and, you know, opens the door. And that I, after that, I, I don't want even to open the door to say, what is all this? I don't, no, I don't think the brain can understand it. Quietly it came, so gently that one was not aware of it, so close to the earth among the flowers. It was spreading, covering the earth, 
and one was in it. Not as an observer, but of it. There was no thought or feeling. The brain utterly quiet. Suddenly, there was an innocence, so simple, so clear and delicate. It was a meadow of innocence, past all pleasure and ache, beyond all torture of hope and despair. It was there, and it made the mind, one's whole being, innocent. One was of it, past measure, past word, the mind transparent, and the brain young, without time. The first time I really met him was in Brockwood, the first, my first year in a student meeting. And there was, it made me, it made me shocked to see this 90 years old man just walking in and really frail. I mean, he was frail and it was strange to see him like that. I mean, he was very old. And he sat down and he was very innocent, you know. He looked around and looked at us, smiled at us. But you didn't know, I mean, I, would, I didn't see intelligence as I knew it, you know, knowledge. And when he started talking, we questioned him first a lot, you know, when he was a student. We questioned him and he was re he got involved, quite involved, very involved in what he's saying. And there you couldn't see the old man at all. He was so fresh, so young, so in charge of everything, aware of us, yeah, aware. And in talking to him, I was 14, he was 19, but I was older than him, I was stuck. He was so young and fresh, yeah. And the talk end, and there again was the old man who forgot everything he had talked about. I knew I should probably not see him again, and I wanted to take this opportunity of really coming into contact with him, to really exposing myself, really finding out about this Scottish Pratt business. And I said to him, sir, I would like to, uh, if I can, uh, lay myself out on the table in, in front of you so that you can help me to see what I am. He, he at once jumped in at me almost sharply and said, Miss Pratt, you're like all the rest of them. You come to me with a begging bowl. That really shocked me. It went right through my being. I, I saw it was true that I was coming to him with a begging bowl. And I said after a moment or two, I think I'd better go and think that over. He said, do just that. And with that, he got up and walked out of the room. That was the end of my interview. He didn't touch me on the shoulder. He didn't open the door for me, he just left me. Look at it, please. Answer it yourself. Go into it yourself. Don't depend on me, on the speaker. It's not worth it. It has no value. It's just a verbal entity, a telephone. But you have to find the answer. Why? Is it? We are observing together. So you are not learning it from the speaker. It's not teaching you anything. Please understand this. It's not teaching you a thing. Therefore you are not his followers. He's not your authority. He's not your guru. They've all led you astray. Because they've never been able to solve this problem. Or never tackle this problem. So, in observing together, we're going to discover why this conflict exists. Whether it's possible to end completely not theoretically, not for a day, end it. This conflict exists, must exist. I don't want to tell you because it becomes so silly. 
Okay, if I tell you, you say yes, that's quite right. And then you are back in the... It isn't something that you yourself have discovered. You know what happens when you discover something for yourself, psychologically? You have immense energy. And you need energy. Free by the mind of its conditioning. If you were listening to Krishnaji, he was not a guru. If you were accepting what he was saying, he was a guru. So the fact of whether he was a guru was n or not did not lie with Krishnaji. It lay in the audience who listened, in the person who felt that every word he said was biblical, to be followed without questioning. The listening is in essence the questioning. And when listening is truly flowering, the Guru is not. It was unfortunate when people treated Kay as a god because that was really uh, at odds with what he was saying and what he was asking of people. Kay was very human. He had likes and dislikes, but he was also very focused in his teaching. And his teaching was about the fact that all of us could become responsible and sane people, living a life that had real meaning. And to abstract K as a god was to really deny the teaching, was to say, well, a K can do that, but I can't. And if anything, uh, if K said anything, it was that, you, that we were all capable of doing this, if we would attend to it and attend to the, what was going on inside of us and outside of us at the same time. Krishnaji, perhaps for the first time in the spiritual evolution of mankind, uh, is one who denies, who negates the role and the authority and the aura that goes with the Guru. And uh, perhaps that uh, m marks him uh, a distinct place in the whole uh, uh, history of spiritual quests uh, around the world. Now, of all the Zen sayings, the one that I find most interesting is the saying, if you see Buddha, kill him destroy him. And this is a very profound statement that if you take a man and venerate him as a god, then in that veneration all possibility of reality, of sartori, of enlightenment will disappear. And so if you see Buddha, you're seeing an illusion, get rid of it quickly. He was attempting in his conversations, his questioning with me, to not for me to be talking with Krishnamurti, but for me to be talking to myself in a way that perhaps I had never done before. And he had a way of posing questions and rephrasing questions that made me really stop, pause, and look deeply in a way that I wasn't used to to inquire what was, what was at the root of what I was asking. And it worked for me. It worked in the sense that I wasn't talking so much with Krishnamurti. There was no personality of the man there. I was looking at a, at a deeper reflection of myself. Meditation was pure delight, without a flutter of thought, with its endless subtleties. It was a movement that had no end, 
and every movement of the brain was still, watching from emptiness. It was an emptiness that had known no knowing. It was an emptiness that had known no space. It was empty of time. It was empty past all seeing, knowing, and being. In this emptiness, there was fury, the fury of a storm, the fury of an exploding universe, the fury of creation which could never have any expression. It was the fury of all life, death, and love. But yet, it was empty, a vast, boundless emptiness which nothing could ever fill, transform, or cover up. Meditation was the ecstasy of this emptiness. being very compassionate, being very compassionate. But there's never a sentimentality about this, and there is a tendency sometimes for us to, to be sentimental in the way in which we read his actions, or what he does, what he says. And this was brought home to me very much in a rather a delightful way, I think, some years ago when he was in England, and several of us were sitting in a room with him. And we were discussing something fairly serious, and Krishnaji was there, and he was joining in the discussion. Not perhaps as wholeheartedly as he sometimes does, but nevertheless, he was talking. And suddenly, his whole being seemed to light up, and there was almost a radiance about him, and this wonderful smile. And we thought, you know, something amazing was going to come, you know, words of tremendous depth and significance, and we all turned to him. And, you know, it was as if a light had gone on in the room, and he stood up and he said, mangoes, fresh mangoes. And he walked to the door, and there was someone, man, coming up the path with a basket of fresh mangoes for Krishnaji. And, of course, this was in England when it was not all that easy to get fresh mangoes. But, you know, this was a wonderful moment because one shook oneself and realised that here he was responding totally to the moment, in a sense, we were losing the moment because we were so concerned with something else which was perhaps, you know, out there or um, in the world of the intellect. I wouldn't presume to make a statement of what the essence of the teachings is. But I can only imagine that because Krishnaji did live what he was talking about, that what he was talking about was the quality of his living. And that, from what I could see, would be impossible to put into words. But it did have to do with affection. It had to do with a deep sense of beauty. And that somehow beauty and, and this affection and this attention that he had were somehow related to something that was sacred. And he saw this as something that not just he could live, but that other people could live too. Now we proceed now? No. Right. The, is the observer different from that which he's observing? Yes, well... Uh, that is the real the question. question. Yes, yes, well... Uh, you could say that's the root of the power of the image. Yeah, then. yeah. Ordinarily, we think uh, uh, that when I'm thinking of myself, that self is a reality which is independent of thought. Do you see? Isn't yes, that? we think that's independent of thought. Uh, and there, and that there, that 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 self is the observer, who is a reality. Quite. Who is uh, independent of thought and who is thinking, who is yes. producing thought. 
but it is the product of thought. Uh, yes, but that's the confusion. I'm yes, quite, quite, quite. You're saying, then, that this image of me is... is non-reality. It's no reality. Well, it, the only reality is that it's thought, right? Uh, yes, it's not a reality of... independent of thinking, right? So we must go back to find out what is reality. Right. Reality, we said, is everything that thought has put together. Uh, the table, wait a minute, yeah. the illusion, hmm? right. the churches, the nations, everything that thought has contrived, put together, is reality. Right. But nature is not reality. Right. Is not put together by thought, but it's a reality. It's right. a reality independent of independent thought. Independent of thought. Right. But you see, is the me who uh, is looking a reality that is independent of thought, like nature. That's the whole point. You understood? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to say. Could I put it another way? Suppose you're watching a conjuring trick and uh, say you perceive a woman being sawn in half, you see. <laughs> and then when you see the trick, you say, w what is your perception of this woman who is being sawed in half? You say, it isn't because she isn't being sawed in half, right? Mm -hmm. You see, I'm trying to say, as long as you uh, don't see through the trick, what you see is apparently real. Is somebody being cut in half, right? Right. <laughs> but you've missed certain points. Right. And, but when you see the points that you've missed, you don't see anybody being cut in half. Right. Right. You just see a trick. Right. Well, I think the ultimate purpose of Kay's work was stated very early in his life, in his work, which was to free humanity from uh, the destructive conditioning we've been talking about. That is, uh, this uh, conditioning around the... Um, self-centered thought is really an enslavement, an enslavement to absurdity, to destruction, to unhappiness, sorrow. And it, no other kind of freedom means anything unless we are free from that. <laughs> and therefore, I think that he felt that once man was free from that, then the room would be, the way would be open to creative uh, unfoldment in all, in all sorts of uh, directions. The problem with Kay's teachings Oftentimes, the problem with Kay and the problem for people involved with him, the trap that they fall into, was that the whole thing was so much constructed in thought that it was talking about thought, but very often it was the speeches were so much about thought, the intricacies of analysis with thought, the uh, dilemmas of thought that very often it was a little bit an instance of its own uh, uh, complaint. And as a result, people thought they could think their way to this understanding. And left alone, very often, they would uh, simply become more and more involved in, well, thought is not good, I shouldn't be thinking, and they would become obsessed with that, or they would think that it's not good to think, and therefore they weren't thinking, because they thought it was not good to be thinking. And it may be the ending of this image maker and all that, there a meditation must take place to, to delve to have an insight into something which, I've ne which mind has never touched before. Mm -hmm. right. See, there's several things involved. Right. To penetrate into this, there must be, the mind must be completely silent. Right. Right? right. Otherwise, you are projecting something into mm -hmm. it. Right. Right. It is not projecting into anything. Yeah. That's a the absolute silence. Right. And that silence is not the product of control, right. Right. wished for, premeditated, predetermined. Right. Therefore, that silence is not brought about through will. Right. Right? Right. Now, in that silence, there is, there is this sense of Something beyond all time, all death, all thought. Mm -hmm. Something. Yeah, no. Uh, and uh, uh, could nothing. Not a thing. Yes. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And therefore empty, and therefore tremendous energy. 
Is there and this moving. Absolutely. Energy. Don't leave it. Leave it. Is this also the source of compassion? Then? That's what I... That's it. What do you mean by source? Well, that this... Uh, in this energy is compassion. Is that... Yes, that's right. And in this energy... This energy is... Is compassion. compassion. Mm. That's different. Yeah, of course. This energy is compassion. I think that one of the dilemmas of the whole thing with Kay and why so many people had a lot of difficulties with it and why a lot of people didn't like it and why a lot of people who have been involved with it have imagined themselves to be, uh, so to speak, uh, enlightened or they know what's happening and very often your impression was that they had put their lives on ice, they had put their feelings on ice, they had put their uh, existences, their sexuality, their, uh, the dynamic uh, joy of existence, the fun, all of the things that were really uh, the rich potpourri of life, uh, they had lost. And I think, unfortunately, toward K, the end of Kay's life, he had lost some of that. And, and earlier in life, he was having a lot more fun. He was a delight to go with, he will joke with you, he will talk with you, you can go for walks with him, you can correct, he used to sit and edit his works, you can sit by him, you can... Such fun it was being with him, he enjoyed being with you. In the fifties, I would say roughly by the end of the fifties, this personal uh, factor gradually started dimming. Later on, I found he became very severe, very serious rather, and then onwards, there was very little of the personal in him. And as years went by, one could see that he was deeply concerned with the state of humanity. Why is it not changing? Fifty years he has taught, he has spoken, he has traveled all over the world. Why is not a single person transformed? He was deeply concerned with this problem, with this situation rather. And therefore, he had no, there was no place for personal factor, personal relationship. And we, all of us who had known him knew that personal element was, had no longer any place. It was only to the extent to which you were aware, you had a different terrain of mind, that you could be, talk with him, dialogue with him. And this continued through the years. There is something sacred, untouched by man. Man is an untouched by his mind by his cravings, by his demands, by his prayers, by his everlasting chicanery, tricks. And that may be the origin of everything, which man has misused, you oh. follow? Mm -hmm. Not that it exists in him, because then we get mm -hmm. lost. And if you say it's the origin of, of all matter or all nature? Of oh, every, of all matter, of all nature. And of all you know, mankind. Yes. That's right, sir. I'd stick by it. <laughs> <laughs> Have I got anything out of all this? Have you given me the perfume of that thing? Can I give you the perfume? Or... Yes, sir. Share it with me. Mm. I can share it with you. Has the viewer shared with us yes. the have experience you, we've had you, being together? Have you two shared this thing with this man? Right. Have we shared this with this man? If not, then mm -hmm. what, what? A clever discussion. Dialogue. Yeah. Oh, that we are fed up. <laughs> You can only share when you're really hungry. Hmm. You follow? Burning with hunger. Otherwise you share words. I, I, I feel troubled. Have we shared it? Yes, sir. That's, that burns, that question burns. Have we shared the sacred? Which means, really, all these discussions, uh, dialogues, have been a process of meditation. Right. Hmm? Not 
a clever argument, mm -hmm. a real penetrating meditation which brings insight into everything that's being said. Mm -hmm. And whatever we say must, must then lead to that ultimate thing. Mm -hmm. Then you, you're not sharing. <laughs> Where are you? But there's no sharing. It's only that. That. Krishnamurti's teachings are for, to me, a future generation. We are privileged to be in the uh, forefront of the whole thing. But to me, they're, they're imperishable because they cannot be destroyed. They're not rooted in belief, which can be destroyed. But being able to eliminate belief uh, is one of the main objects of the interest in Krishnamurti. There was an uncompromising quality uh, to his teachings uh, that he never let go of. Um, there was no point at which he would declare anyone as having understood or seen something or arrived because that would be anathema to him and to the intent of the teachings. I was charmed then the first time by the fact that the, the car park contained everything from ancient little Volkswagen bugs to Rolls Royces and other very expensive cars. Uh, but on the other hand, when I heard he was going to lecture in New York, I went to hear him in Carnegie Hall and amazed that every seat was filled and there was even standing room there. Second time in New York, the same thing. Now, I had no sense of the size of this following because a following that appears in a hall to hear a speaker is only a fraction of a following that has been unable to come to that hall and hear this speaker. So evidently, Krishnamurti's influence is very wide. I felt some kind of a tremendous intensity come towards me and he was looking at me, holding my uh, gaze just like that. And then he said, you know, those people who go around helping other people, I think they are a curse. And I <laughs> just was, uh, you know, taken aback and realized that he was speaking about me. And for a moment I didn't know what to say. And then I said, but what do you think you're doing? You're doing the same thing. You are helping people. And he said, but I don't do it on purpose. Well, Krishnamurti traveled almost annually a, a world orbit and lived, would live typically for several months in different countries, like India, United States, and England, and Europe. And he would, he maintained uh, over his life long, long-term relationships. So there was, despite this incessant travel, there was, there was continuity. And he had close relationships from early days with the top people in, uh, in the various governments of the world, in India and in England and so on, as well as, uh, as contacts with very humble people. So he was in a position that perhaps has, been, has never been possible before in, history of, uh, through this incessant travel, to have a sense of the unity of the world, as well as its diversity. It has been said that Krishnamurti began where Buddha ended. Buddha is supposed to have brought rationality into spirituality. Krishnamurti goes beyond, and he shows us the limitations of thought as a means of psychological mutation. And he shows that pure perception, which is not related to time or to thought, acts. And that perception which acts, that breaks away the pattern of the brain, in which human being has been caught over a million years repeating the same thing over and over again. When Buddha 
teach the people, he comes down to the level of the listener. Whereas the Krishnanji doesn't come down to the level of the listener. He always speak of his own level. The Buddha deals with two labels, namely the relative and the absolute. One Buddha speak of absolute. I personally do not find any difference with the Krishnaji's teachings or the Krishnaji's teaching with the Buddha's teaching of Parjamparamita or the Absolute Truth. When Buddha speak of relative truth, he always compromise with the acceptance and notions and thoughts of people with whom he is speaking. But Krishnaji never compromise or never accepts the conditions or the labels of the, his listener. Dawn wouldn't come for a couple of hours. On waking, with eyes that have lost their sleep, one was aware of an unfathomable cheerfulness. There was no cause to it, no sentimentality or that emotional extravagance, enthusiasm behind it. It was clear, simple cheer, uncontaminated and rich, untouched and pure. There was no thought or reason behind it, and neither could one ever understand it, for there was no cause to it. This cheerfulness was pouring out of one's whole being, and the being was utterly empty. As a stream of water gushes out from the side of a mountain, naturally and under pressure, this cheer was pouring out in great abundance, coming from nowhere and going nowhere. The heart and mind would never be the same again. Silence is something which comes in naturally when you're watching. When you're watching without motive, without any kind of demand, just to watch and see the beauty of a single star in the sky, or to watch a single tree in a field, or to watch your si wife or husband, whatever you watch, to watch with great silence and space, then in that watching, in that alertness, then there is something that which is beyond words, beyond all measure. We use words to measure the immeasurable. So one must be aware also of the network of words. Our words cheat us. Our words means so, so much. A communist to a capitalist means something terrible. Socialist or some stranger. For words become extraordinarily important. But to be aware of those words and to weigh the words, to weigh to live with the word silence, knowing that the world is not silence, but to live with that word and see the weight of that word, the content of the word, the beauty of that word. So 
soon begins to realise. When thought is quiet, watching, if there is something beyond all imagination, doubt, and seeking, and there is such thing, at least for the speaker. But what the speaker says has no validity to another, unless you listen, learn, watch, with totally free from all the anxieties of life. Well, he, he was the teachings, although I hesitate to use the word teachings, it makes it finite, and I think it was an ongoing quest, adventure, and in that he personified, he, he was the teachings, if you must use that word, he, his, he lived it, I mean by the care and attention that he gave to everything, and the depth of his passion, and his affection and love for mankind, yes, I think it did have an impact. You felt leavened by his presence. I mean, you couldn't just... Everybody noticed him the moment he came in a room. You couldn't help it. He carried a quality with him that was rare and, and strong. When he came into a room, there was a light that came into the room. And uh, just to be in his presence was like a cool breeze on a hot day. I mean, there was something absolutely beneficial about being near him. And it was his degree of affection that he had for people and his interest in people and his interest in our being something more than we had set for ourselves. When I decided to see him, I wanted to say to him this much and that much, and I wanted to expect his answer to my questions, this and that. But when I really saw him, I instantly couldn't do anything, couldn't say anything. And I, w I could not express my feeling to him and uh, did not want to e expect any answer from him because I instantly felt a strong wave of love surrounded me. And uh, I was over flooded in that, in that flood. And then now I consider to myself nothing more was necessary for me than to shake hands with him and feel with him together this strong wave of love. When you read the biographies, you, you hear mention various psychic phenomena that is um, associated with him, but it seems to be really downplayed. And the authors, I would say we probably are not looking to highlight that in any type of way. Or, but there is more that meets the eye, I would say, with Krishnamurti. And uh, he would not really try to expose that. Instead, he would downplay these phenomena. Something took place. There was as if the room awoke. and then light entered into him, which was not imagined. And when I said in the, my book that he appeared to grow in size, it was a feeling that he filled the room, that there was nothing else but that which was there. We also should talk about what is beauty. What is the quality of mind that has beauty? 
Can beauty exist where the mind is in conflict? Where you have problems, one or many, can beauty exist? Or beauty is there when you are not there? Have you ever looked at a great mountain, the majesty, the dignity, the immovability of that mountain when you look at it? For a moment, the majesty of it drives away all your problems for a second. That is, at that moment you, with all your problems, are not there. And you say, what a marvellous thing that is! There, the outward greatness drives away the pettiness of yourself. So when you, with your problems, with your anxieties, with your loneliness, with your attachments, are not there, is not, are not there, then beauty is. And where there is beauty and love, life becomes an extraordinary movement. On that path, a yellow leaf fell. It was a single leaf, with not a blemish on it, unspotted, clean. Death was there, not in the yellow leaf, but actually there. Not an inevitable, traditionalized death, but that death, which is always there. It is always there around every bend of a road, in every house, with every God. You can't avoid death. Do what you will. Go to any temple or book. It is always there, in festival and in health. You must live with it to know it. The knowledge of it isn't the ending of it. It's the end of knowledge, but not of death. To love it is not to be familiar with it. You can't be familiar with destruction. You only love that of which you were certain, that which gives comfort, security. You do not love the uncertain, the unknown. You may love danger, give your life for another or kill another for your country, but this is not love. There is no profit in knowing death, but strangely death and love always go together. They are never separate. You can't love without death. You can embrace without death being there. Where love is, there is also death. They're inseparable. He said the same thing from the beginning to the end. He said recently that there wouldn't be another teacher like this for 500 years. He said that in the very beginning. There won't be another one like this for 500 years. He said that right back in 1926, and he's saying it again now. Uh, and he said that the tears of all the world have produced the world teacher. That was a very striking thing that struck me as very, very forcibly. The tears of all the world have produced the world teacher. I think most people took Krishnamurti for granted because for 65 years he made this world circuit and in the spring or in the winter he would appear. He would come back and he would give talks and he would give interviews and there would be lunch and we would go on with what we had come for decades to be used to. 
When Krishnamurti died, he wasn't there. He wasn't there to talk with. He wasn't there to ask questions. He wasn't there to answer. He wasn't there to talk things over. And for me, and I think for others, we were suddenly left with the teaching, which he said would happen. But it actually was a fact that we had no place to turn but ourselves. And that was a very, very great shock. Towards the last year of his life, he said to me that he felt that people do not even have the foggiest idea what he is talking about. So, if he had started out with a mission for achievement, what could be more disappointing than to have worked hard at this for 60 years and at the end of it having to make such a statement? But he was not disappointed. And every time he would start afresh and he would again address himself to the question with whatever audience he was with. Uh, it was as if sanctity hung like a curtain over the Ganges, making one feel, uh, conveying um, what I felt was a sense of intense tenderness plus a clarity of vision so that my, my mind was very still and alert and I could see far and wide around me and my heart melted constantly. Uh, it, it had nothing to do with the people around me but I felt very tender and it was this combination of clarity and tenderness that uh, I associate with sanctity. And he was dying and his body was weak, but it was as if the sanctity oozed out of him, radiated out of him and filled the world in Banaras. On the 1st of February, I went to see him in his bedroom at Pine Cottage because by that time he had been discharged from hospital. And when I met him in the morning, I was utterly shocked at his condition. He could hardly raise his hand to shake mine. He didn't recognize me. His attention span was less than two seconds because his eyes couldn't keep open. And it wasn't only with me because my aunt and my cousin were with there too. And the same thing happened with them. So we were in a state of great shock to see him like that when a month earlier he had been the old Krishnamurti talking to 6,000 people going for walks engaging in serious discussion. When I went to see him the next day, an astonishing thing happened. He smiled and he held my hand and I felt a strong pulse beating. And suddenly in his old vo voice, a strong voice, he said, Sir, where is your anchor? So I said, in you, sir. And he replied instantly, I'm going. And then he said, if you have touched that, you must be anchored in it, otherwise you will go to pieces. And then he smiled and he said, you're a nice chap, but you're wasting your life. And then he closed his eyes. You see, we have made life into a hideous thing, living. Life has become a battle, mm -hmm. which is an obvious fact. Mm -hmm. Constant fight, fight, fight. And we have divorced that living from death. We separate death as something uh, horrible, something to be frightened about. And we say, and to us this living, which is misery, is we accept. If we didn't accept this existence as misery, then life and death have, are the same movement. Like love, death and living are one. One must totally die to find what love is. 
And to go into this question of what, what is death, what lies beyond death, whether there is reincarnation, whether there is a resurrection, for all that, becomes rather meaningless if you don't know how to live. If, if the human being knows how to live in this world without conflict, then death has a, quite a different meaning. The river was everything. They bathed in it. They washed their clothes in it. They worshipped it and died beside it. The river was so indifferent to their joy and sorrow. It was so deep. There was such weight and power behind it. It was terribly alive and so dangerous. The flashing river was now the light of the sky, enchanted dreaming and lost in its beauty and love. In this light, all things cease to exist, the heart that was crying and the brain that was cunning. Pleasure and pain went away, leaving only light, transparent, gentle and caressing. It was light. Thought and feeling had no part in it. They could never give light. They were not there. Only this light, when the sun is well beyond the walls of the city and not a cloud in the sky. You cannot see this light unless you know the timeless movement of meditation. The ending of thought is this movement. The brain was completely still but very alive and watching, without a center. The otherness was there, deep within at a depth that was lost wiping away everything without leaving a mark of what has been or what is. It was simply a fact, like a sunset, like death and the curving river. <laughs> 